All right, you're asking for it, so here it is. Epicast. Listen to this. Yes, sir. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome to a special live episode of the Drinking Partners Podcast coming straight from Fresh Fest 2019. We are in the building. We are strong. For those who do not know, I am half of your hosting tandem, Ed Bailey. I'm joined as always, but I got a new partner because I don't know this dude over here. <laughs> Uh-oh. This dude got the sun's out, guns out going on. <laughs> and he got all the taco meats. That's my boy, Dave Bracey. Say what up to the people. What's good with you people? Uh, all right. We, Look at that soft flex. Screw we me. are the uh, drinking partners, <laughs> and if you're... If you're looking for us, you can find us at Fresh Fest 2019. Uh, you can also find us on EpicastNetwork.com slash PartnersPod. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Lipson, Google Play, and Spotify under Drinky Partners. You can find us on IG, Twitter, and Facebook at PartnersPod. Uh, this is a very special episode, but we're going to ask you anyway, man. Please hop on iTunes, hop on Facebook, rate and review. Uh, that's how we know what we're doing well. That's how we let others know that we're doing well. And that's how we continue to do well, man. So please... Hop on iTunes, hop on Facebook, rate and review. Hop on anything on the internet. But before we get started, I just want to acknowledge, man, this is, this is a beautiful, I mean, to say this is a beautiful scene would be a vast understatement, man. Give it up for yourselves. Yeah. Packing this shit out. <laughs> VIP Brown is shit. We are, we are proud, we are pleased to, to see you all. But uh, they, I think they just want us to get right in. Our guests, they don't yeah, want to yeah, hear they us. Yeah, they ain't here for us. Yeah, I mean, they got we, like uh, 200 <laughs> some episodes of us. Yeah, yeah, y'all, y'all sick of us, man. We, uh, we got a very special guest here. Very um, special. All the way out of uh, Brooklyn, New York. The headmaster um, of Brooklyn Brewery. The man, the myth, the legend. Mr. Renaissance himself. Everybody give it up for Garrett Oliver. Say what up to the people. Good to be here, guys. Normally, I might wear the crown prince of hats. Today, I brought the Playboy Prince. Ooh! Playboy Prince isn't seen that often, you know. So well, we got a we special, got a special hat for Playboy special Cardi occasion. out special here. Occasion. Wow! You gotta be stepping my hat game up because uh, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> with a dad hat, you can't. I, I ain't even nearly as fresh. You can't hey, look, you know, the dad hat. You got, <laughs> you got more hair. You don't need any hat, you know. So. You're doing fine. Now you got the flat top. You good? No, you in no, there? I'm still hanging in there, but you, you know, you in there. And I you're in the building. We're very I, I got out of the game when I was like six. <laughs> <laughs> I, I ain't had a hairline since I left the crib. So I mean, was... he shaved his arms too, though. He shaved yeah. his arms. <laughs> <laughs> had to get a nice wax going on. You know what I, mean? I ain't mad at it. Now, I'm out here working. I'm waiting for a shirt to get in this money. All oh, y'all, y'all bought up all the shirts, man. I ain't got none. You know what I mean, I'm waiting for one to come in. It'll be all right. I'll be fresher at some point. Yeah, you know I mean, I know y'all intimidated by these guns. You know, it's all right. You'll see all that security out there. They let me in there. They know I'm safe. You know what I mean? All right, enough. You give them one they compliment. Until later. I am totally You give pumped. your mans one compliment. <laughs> so for those who do not know, I mean, I know everyone in the building is familiar, but we do have some people who listen to us on the internet. So let people know who you are, how you came into the beer game. Well, I am Garrett Oliver. I am the brewmaster of Brooklyn Brewery for the last... Thank you. And I am 400 years old. <laughs> I have always been here like Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I have crossed oceans of time to be with you. So, you know, this, uh, this is a beautiful occasion for me because I've been, you know, in this game for 30 years. And I, have ne- and I have never, ever, ever, ever seen a room like this. I was in yeah. Africa, you know. Yeah. I was sitting as the chair, you know, whatever, for uh, uh, the Africa Beer Cup in South Africa several weeks ago, and even that room didn't look like this. Wow. So <laughs> We, we yeah, more well, Africa than Africa? Well, well yeah. I, 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 <laughs> we'll, we, we, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, I heard the Chinese. You know, things get real in South property. Africa. You yeah. know, it's like, all right, you know, people are trying hard. There's a little bit more to be done. <laughs> a little bit more to be done. A little bit more to be done. 
Yeah. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Am I, am I all, supposed it, to do it? It got all deep on him. He was yeah. like, you know. All the I, a moment. He, he seized up. Yo, when, when Gary's all of that, work are you done, he's like, you talking about like right now? Like, <laughs> I didn't know I it was do. on me. I just, so yeah. I've been bestowed that responsibility. That's what's happening. So, um, right. I mean, I guess tell us, um, tell us what, uh, what you've seen in these last 30 years in beer and in, in, in beer and 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 how it's how it's developed because i mean the last 30 years for me has just been like puberty and <laughs> like oh like snap kinda, all right you're gonna roll it like 30 that years that's all right that's all right 30 years of puberty that's <laughs> you know i think mean, i got I'll, a girlfriend I'll, once so I'll, yeah, I'll, I mean, it's just, I'll tell you my times right after the civil war but you know yeah. no uh it's uh, it's it's interesting, you know. This uh, the whole thing with craft beer. Some a lot of you aren't old enough to remember, you know, what it used to be like. And the craft beer scene, really, and this is an important thing to understand. The craft beer scene is just part of an entire movement of a recovery of the American food system. I grew up inside the Matrix, so you know where when you went to the supermarket in the 1970s and the 1980s. Everything you saw was a lie. Every single last thing. Bag of cheese. Yeah, bag of cheese. There were four cheeses. There was one kind of bread. There was one kind of beer. There was also Guinness. Um, Okay. You know, which 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 was the other stuff, which I started drinking at sixteen. and so, you know, I got to England, I moved to England, I got my film degree, and I intended to make films. My father was an art director for y so he was one of the earliest African-Americans working at the very top of the advertising industry. If you saw Mad Men, that was the world that he was in, you know, and so when, when by the time he passed, he was a trustee of the Rhode Island School of Design. Milton Glaser, who designed, you know, our logo and everything else, his books were coffee table books in my house growing up. But we were, so we were strange people. Like, we went to, you know, I, I was on a flight back from Ghana in 1974 when they announced to the plane that Richard Nixon had resigned the presidency. Did they, did they like, stand up and cheer? You didn't, you didn't believe me when I said I was 400 years old, did you? <laughs> you, you, thought, you, you thought that was a joke. I'm over here you know, amazed by all these soft no, you know, throwing out about You know the jobs. opening for like Wolverine where they show him in the Civil War and then he's in World <laughs> War II and whatever else? That's me. So, so basically you're Morgan Freeman's brother. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly so. And so, you know, and so, yeah, you have to imagine uh, there was no craft beer scene. There was no craft anything. We had, and I got to, to England and I found that this beer, the stuff they called us beer, like that they were lying. There was all this other beer. And then I went to Europe and there were all these other beers. And then there was all this bread. And I still remember seeing my first cheese shop. You know, in Hollis, Queens, we didn't have any cheese shop. There was no cheese shop. You know, there were four cheeses. You know, and we knew. And I'm, I'm like, you know, th- there are hundreds of cheeses in here. And some of them are green and they're covered in mold. And this place smells. What's that smell? And they say, it is the fromage, monsieur. And I'm like, I've seen all four cheeses. And none of them look like that. What, what is this? Okay. And, and I got home and I realized, like, I was angry. I'm like, they lied to us. And the entire idea, I mean, I, I'm going to take you back. Because you need to, everybody kind of needs, I think, to understand this. I'm going to make it really fast. The whole point in the 1800s, late 1800s, we had 48 breweries in Brooklyn. They made 15% of all the beer in the United States. We had 4,000 breweries in the United States, and we made everything. We had everything. In a place like New York City, we had the most interesting food culture in the whole world because we had everybody from everywhere. If you did not like the food from where your people were from, say your people are from Campania, you're tired of Campanian food your mother's making you, you walk 15 minutes that way, and you were in a different country, they spoke another language, and they had different food. New York City and a lot of other places, a nation of immigrants about which we should be proud. You know, because... Yeah. Yeah. Fuck ice. Because I travel, <laughs> I travel the all, of the, all over the world, and nobody has a more interesting food scene than we do. Great food scenes, yes. But more interesting, more diverse, no. So we get into 1920, you got Prohibition. Now, we think prohibition is an anti-alcohol movement. In fact, it is an anti-Catholic, anti-German movement. Remember, it's 1920. Yeah, yeah. Wait, the was, entire, was, yes, Germans. Like, so, wait, so the Catholics were like, like big drinking beer, getting all, you know what I mean? Drinking crazy. beer Turn. on Sunday. 
big deal back then. You know, for in those days, Protestants didn't drink on Sunday, but for Catholics, Sunday's the day for drinking. Day to drink. <laughs> yeah, that's the big drinking day. You follow you follow the priest out of the out of the church and into the pub. That's the classic. It's the that, original cheat no, day. I mean anybody who's been to Ireland, you know that's the, that's that, that's <laughs> that's the classic. That's what you did. And imagine this. Okay, in 1920, two years after World War I, the meetings of the Master Brewers Association of the Americas were held in German. Okay, now remember, 20 years later, we were taking Japanese Americans and we were putting them in concentration camps. You know, and as George Takei said, it's like, well, you know, it's like, shouldn't you just call them internment camps? It's like, no, you know, <laughs> there are death camps and there are concentration camps. We put them in camps. And they were, a lot of them were Americans. And we did that. So you can imagine what they thought of Germans in 1920. You know, uh, only a couple of years after World War I. So they wanted to shut all this down. The most important part, though, is we come out, and it's a whole different world. 13 years, but so is 1990 to 2003. One is before the Internet, one is after the Internet. Completely different world. Tro you know, roads, trucks, radio. And they said, you know what? If we could make everybody forget everything that they ever ate and drank before, and we made one version of each thing, and we sold them that thing... We could get all the money. Not some of the money, not our fair share of the money, all the money. And that was the idea of American capitalism. We will wipe your mind and we will replace your, the things that you knew with everything, with all this garbage, and we will feed it to you every day until you believe it. George Orwell. George Orwell. And, and they did it. They did it. So you knew... When you, when you saw a loaf of bread and it had 50 ingredients, you knew in your heart that bread didn't have 50 ingredients? Right. You knew in your heart that bread, you know, only, you, know you ever made a loaf of bread? Somebody in your family made a loaf of bread? No, I haven't. I, <laughs> I, uh, I, gave, you, I gave you a big chance, I, man. I, I was with you, too. You, you could have yeah. rolled roll right up in that yeah. shit and just said, like, yeah, yeah. man, I made some yesterday. I'm a, I'm a Schwabels kid, man. All right. Just Somebody don't in tell your me family Schwabel, made some bread. So Schwabels is not official. All right. Wait. Somebody in you somebody, heard me. anybody's family made some bread in here? All right. How long How does was a loaf shaped? of bread stay fresh? A day, two days. Okay. A loaf of bread does not stay fresh in a bag for two weeks. Even in the refrigerator? The thing in the even in the refrigerator. What about on top of the refrigerator? <laughs> <laughs> True. Well, uh, 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 Y'all uh, know what time 12, it is. Twelve. At top of the refrigerator, bread. Twelve. 12 hours on top of the refrigerator. <laughs> 12 hours on top of the refrigerator. I thought it lasted from one holiday no. to the next. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, they call that Pam Perdue. Lost oh, bread. Yeah. yeah, that's the thought. You, you, you better lose that. So, you raised me wrong. So, you, you know, you, 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 you come out after a prohibition. We got everything. And we had this. We took actual food and we made food facsimiles. We took you know, actual cheese, and we made it into these melting slices, which cannot technically be called cheese because they are not cheese. Now, you know good and goddamn well, you, you can put a slice of that in your pocket and walk around with it for a month and then take it out and eat it. It won't be any different. That's not cheese. They told you it was cheese. It's a lie. It's a lie. The bread was not a bread, and the beer we were drinking was not beer. And I got back, and I was angry, and I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not eating this shit anymore. I'm not drinking this shit anymore. I'm not cooking this anymore. I'm not having any more of that. They're going to feed me, and my father was into it. It's like, I'm going to eat real food. They so, came, you know, they took the real food away from us, and they gave us commerce, uh, a facsimile of food that was meant to represent food but was not food. And I'm like, we did the sa same thing with beer. And as I was saying to people, it's like uh, uh, my entire career, people saying, wow, it must be fascinating for you, like an African-American, to be making beer. It's like, we've been doing this for 5,000 years. Five, you know, been doing this thousand shit. years. You know, 5,000. Every... Every single society, up and down Africa, east to west, you know, the, every single society is based around the brew pot. It is always communal. You know, there are uh, museums full, you know, of these things, sometimes based on sorghum, sometimes based on millet, sometimes on wheat, sometimes on barley, sometimes on phonio, but every single society. And then someone's got the nerve to walk up to you and say, how it must be very nice for you that you've discovered this. You know... It's like, really? Like, that, that's, that's, that must be very beautiful for you to, uh, uh, to, to have seen it yourself. Because, uh, you know, we, we, you know uh, I hope you enjoyed it. We gave it to you. 
And then typically, <laughs> I mean, and typically you're more well-traveled than these individuals that are coming up to you. So it's even a double slap in the face. Yeah, well, you know, I, look, you know, they don't know. You know, they don't know. It's, you know, it's fine to an extent. You know, but I think that it, it behooves all of us to learn, you know, where all of our cultures came from. You know, and that yeah. this thing always belonged to us. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I just... And not, not only us, I'm not interested in excluding anybody, but that non-exclusion includes us, you know, because right. as I was saying before, you know, it's like they say, oh, look, they, we have George Washington's recipe for whatever else. We have George Thomas Jefferson's, you know, Thomas Jefferson's beer. You know, we've got James Madison's beer. It's like George Washington didn't brew anything. Not a damn <laughs> thing. <laughs> he did not brew anything, not himself. <laughs> You know, when you, read, when you read the letters, he says, my man, my man. Yeah. Yeah, my man. All right. <laughs> Is that what well, Denzel got it His from? man was the guy who knew how to do the brewing, mm. you know. And you got to have saying, a guy. You got to have, you you gotta have, have a, a guy. guy. And, you know, I mean, as Kwame has been teaching, you know, many of us, uh, uh, you know, haute cuisine, so many things, you know, brought into this country, you know, in the same kind of fashion and promulgated. So, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, whether, you know, whether you're of European background or African background or Chinese background, we've all been here a long time. And, you know, we've all been passing this stuff around. And American history is a lot more interesting when you actually know it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, and, 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 and nobody gets excluded from anything. The only thing that happens is things become more interesting. They become deeper, you know, and they become more meaningful, you know, which is exactly what this is all about. As far as I'm concerned, there yeah, it not, is. There it is. I don't know how you feel, but I'm definitely about to die. Based yeah. on, <laughs> like, I, how do you walk around with all that knowledge and then you give it to somebody and they just sit there like, you know what? Nothing I ate. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, Nothing. I'm over here trying to think, like, what did I eat this morning? Like, was that really a biscuit? Like, <laughs> Mama's chili got a whole different feel what was about that it. Sausage. Uh, <laughs> no, I was like, no, my. My dad always told us we love those hot dogs. He's like, it's like, it's like, you know, those are made of cow lips, right? Cow lips, cow noses, whatever else. I'm like, them, them are the most delicious noses I ever. You cook yeah, it yeah. up. It's like, yup, right. Like, mm, cow, yeah. <laughs> hot, hog balls. Like, I'm, I'm ready to eat all of that. But I mean, there's, it, there's a difference between knowing what it is that you're eating. And you said, I've decided to eat some hog balls, you know, uh, uh, ground up and whatever else. And then saying, well, you know, I, I just don't care what it is that I'm going to eat. And the fact of the uh, matter is... Can, can I, do y'all know what hog moths is? Yeah. All right. uh, I, I, I don't usually see this many black people in a room like this, so I had to, had to stop. For the whiter folks, it's, it's, it's pig balls, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so, yeah, B, I'm sorry. No, we got... Look, I, I, you know, I, I, I've, eaten, uh, I've eaten some things things, you know? It's like you get out to, you know, uh, uh, in the countryside in China, you know, uh, you, know <laughs> you, you start eating some things things that we don't, like, we don't... Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's only been a couple of things where Some I'm like, meat, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty yeah. good. There are a few things I'm like, nah, man. <laughs> like, I don't know what part that is. Yeah, right? so I'm like, that's a lot of brains, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, did you have to put a white sauce on it, man? <laughs> you know, like, 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 it didn't have to jiggle like that. You could have <laughs> fried that shit up. <laughs> I'm not part of this conversation. <laughs> You, you shouldn't be. I, I've already I, conceded. I, I tried to get out of that conversation as soon as I got into it. <laughs> brains. I work very hard every day. You know why? So I don't have to eat brains. Mm. That's, why, that's why I have a job. Cheers. Cheers to that. Cheers to not eating brains. I don't know if they got any out there in the food carts or whatever. I don't want to, like, yeah, I mean, throw anybody on. So if you we were in the brains, there might them. be some out there. I don't know. We got to vet them a little better next year. We got yeah, to yeah. have Garrett vet the food vendors. No, so yeah, it's like, you got, you got Kwame. It's all you need. All right. You know, he'll, uh, he you might, you know, he could feed you some brains, though. You better be careful. Yeah, I don't know. You man. never know. That dude, that dude, he's, a, he's like one of those top chefs. So, like, he wanted to, yeah, I mean, he's, th he's used to, like, those secret ingredients and shit. I don't know what he brought here. We, we got to ask. Well, I'm appreciating, you know, what, what, what Mike and you and all these guys are bringing to this. Because I'll tell you, a few years ago, I got a phone call out of the blue. And I was in Slovenia, um, which Another is part of the, flex, just part so of the former... Part of, He'd been flexing on us this whole time. That's the not, 19th not, not, country. Not, not even a made-up country. the 19th country you'd have mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. He'd been mentioning countries that he, that he ain't even do nothing. Like, yeah, and I'm, in wine, and I'm in wine country, and a guy <laughs> calls up, and he wants to ask me. He's from whatever paper, and he wants to ask me um, whether I thought that, given the paucity 
you know, of African Americans, you know, in craft beer, whether I thought that craft beer was somehow racist. And I told him, it's like, I don't mean to be rude to you, but that's a stupid ass question. <laughs> and he's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, have you noticed the country that you live in? Have you noticed that you did not see any black people at your job? Have you noticed that you do not see them, you know, in the fine dining restaurant, either as servers, you know, or in the kitchen or as customers? You know, have you have you read, you know, uh, uh, Margot Jefferson? Have you read uh, 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 the, the stuff that's out there that is there free for you to, to, to pick up? You know, if, if you want to read Tony C. Coates, it's right there. It's a bestseller. You know, you could read and, and have some understanding, but to come to me with this question now. This goes both ways, and I have to ask myself some questions. Why is it that I have people from Mali working for me? I got guys from Iraq working for me. I got guys from Haiti working for me. I got guys from, uh, 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 you know, a Gambian guy is the main guy on our bottling line. You know, very technical, you know, work. I've had one African-American apply for a brewing job in 30 years. One. Why do you think that is? Why do I think that is? Well, I think that's a very complicated question, not a stupid question, a complicated question. Right, so and that, and, 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 and. My shit made it. My and so, made it. I'm recently, straight. I've had some interesting conversations. And, you know, they would go like this. It's like, well, we didn't think that you were going to be there to support. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? i always been here. Like, why didn't you come ask me? It's like, well, I didn't think that you would. Blah, blah, blah. And back and forth, I didn't see you there. Well, I didn't see you there. You know? And it's like, well, you know, this is not a very constructive conversation. And I will tell you, the thing, you know, when I started to see things like this crop up, I'm coming out of the 60s and 70s. Somebody called me an elder last week. I don't know how to take that. Uh, um, but yeah, I came up, the, the whole idea of culture, of cultural literacy, of knowing your heritage and also everybody else's, it's like, okay, when we had things that were ours, you came and took them, or you burned them, you know, or you bombed them, how about this? We're going to roll up and take yours. Now, when we roll up and take yours, everything, we're going to get better than you at the things that you thought you wanted to do, and we're going to take yours. And we're going to hang out with everybody, and we will have integration. We did not want segregation. We didn't want separate but equal. We wanted, like, hey, let's all hang out together. This was the dream of America. And this is what I grew up in, and this is the you know, the value system that I had. So when I saw, oh, we got like a black this and a black this, I'm like, well, why do we, you know, we're not supposed to need that. We're supposed to go in there and roll up and take what's ours in the first place and was always ours, you know, and that we always belonged here and we always belonged everywhere. But I came to realize that my parents, and we are very lucky, had given us a certain kind of armor plating, which you needed, you know, to be a black man in the 60s and 70s coming up. You know, my parent, my, my teachers, you know, I went to a math science high school. My teachers did not tell me that the school existed. They did not tell me there was a test for it. I had a 95 average. There's like, that school's not for you. Then who the hell is it for? You know, so, and that happens every day. Every day, right now, every day. So, you know, the, our parents built us to say, you know, I don't care if you're having dinner with the Queen of England, she's no better than you are, you know, you know your manners, you know, and she knows hers and she better keep them. You know, <laughs> you know, if she's, you know. That last wow. part's important. That make, last part's important, though, to teach yeah, that make, you, you know, are to be make sure, as well. Make sure she knows where the forks go because right. you do. Right. You know, and that's the way that we always rolled. So when I saw the whole thing kind of reversed, I said, I don't know how I feel about that. But what I see in the fact that no one's come to me in 30 years is the fact that my attitude, wherever it comes out of, is not working. You know, the, the evidence of my own eyes is that the thing that I thought was going to happen, you know, we would naturally populate everything. You know, we would naturally populate the, 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 the high-end kitchen. We would naturally populate, you know, everything in society. That has not happened. And therefore, you know, I have to reverse my mindset. Uh, about that if we are actually going to have change because I can keep my mind exactly where it was and we can have the same thing in 30 years and that's not what anybody wants. At least it's not what I want.
So, I mean, I, I, I feel like you're getting to the, to the, um, uh, the point of like meeting the people where they are. You know what I mean, because, you know, like uh, I have a social service background. And the thing is that we ask people, you know, you can't ask people to come outside of their comfort zone. They're there because, you know, they're, they've been oppressed. They've been, you know, they have the, the life that they have and they don't even see it as an option. Like you said, I mean, like, you know, and I've <clears throat> we started like whenever we started out in comedy, we were like, yo, it's two black dudes. We're comedians. We're putting on these shows. Why are all these white people here? You know what I mean, like we didn't get it. We just thought like by being black and putting on these shows <laughs> that black people would come because they were like, oh, they're black. We're black. Let's be yeah, black that, together. That ain't how it works. But yeah, that's I, not I, how that it, that yeah, I mean, how it works. And the same thing even. It actually works to the negative. Like when you black, you actually have to have proven. <laughs> Y'all clap. Y'all, what y'all don't, y'all don't like the guns? Oh, they must be musty. He musty, they like put on a shirt. <laughs> yeah! Yeah! Now he was just going on about how people didn't come to his shows and then y'all start cheering for him getting a shirt. Like, <laughs> it's, oh. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think, uh, you know, even, and then, and with this festival was a thing that we had to also build into it. Uh, we did an event earlier this month, um, going to a, uh, you know, predominantly black neighborhood, lowering the cost of, you know, the barrier, uh, five bucks, you know, just kind of like, you know, kind of, in um, and bringing the people, you know, and, and, and having that safe space in that environment, this festival is that safe space for black people. You don't think about it. You know I mean, like people don't think like, oh, well, you need to build a safe space for black people. What? Like, aren't they the most dangerous people in America? You know what I mean, according to the media, but like, it's dangerous for us to leave our environment. You know what I mean, we can get arrested or killed if we go into an, a neighborhood that we are the minority in. So we typically stick to ourselves. Most people stick to themselves. I mean, that's just how it is. But, you know, um, we have been taught to do that. So like, you need to create these safe spaces so that people can come and try these things and lower some of those barriers and um i think you know uh, uh uh i think you were you know it was it was to the point that you were saying like meeting the people you know where they are so that you know because and 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 a lot of people and it's weird because we've been told as black people that we shouldn't ask for help like you know if we've been pounded like oh you welfare moms like yeah i mean like oh don't ask for a handout da, 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 da. but like that's how all white people start out like they start out with handouts yeah i mean they're born and they come out and like they ask for help they get loans they get like you know they get inheritances they get friends or whatever like they come out they get jobs or whatever and we don't have those same advantages and we're also taught, taught like you know if you go to if you if you see a successful brother and you go hey you're successful can you help me out that's like it's like, it's like frowned upon in, in our culture Whereas, but it's not in the white culture. White people see successful people, they're like, yo, how can I get some of that? Yo, you owe me some of that, actually. <laughs> yeah, he, like, you know, like, and, and, and we don't. Well, we so, feel like we came out the mud to get it. Now you do it the same way. Yeah, you got to do it the same way. And but, it's like, but even, even in, you know, uh, uh, it's funny, Eddie Murphy once had this routine about, like, how, you know, the black community was so much more conservative, you know, than all of his white friends. It's like, you know, they would talk to their mothers in ways that you could never, ever, ever think of talking to your mom no, or your dad or whatever. It's like, it's like you'd been, you know, that would have been the end of the entire world you ever spoke to your, you know, to your parents that way. And so, yeah, there is a certain conservatism. And I remember my, you know, my mother telling me before we went out, we went over to somebody's house. Anybody asks you, you want some food? The answer is no. We fed you, you know, like we fed you, we fed you at home. You know, yeah, you're, 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 have, you, have you heard this before? We, we fed your ass at home. Like, no, you are not hungry. You are never hungry. You've never been hungry. You know? And so, and so, and so like, that's, that's the way we rolled. And we were like, you know, no, we don't need anything from anybody ever. And, you know, we, we, learn, we learning, learning how to accept help is a form of power, you know? Learning how to yes. accept help is a form of power. If you cannot ask for help, you are weak. Right. Yes. You know, because you will not have anybody around you. You're going you're gonna to stand out there and claim in whatever thing that you did that you were a genius and you did this all by yourself. Like, I'm sitting in my chair. I did not do this by myself. Right. I did not do this by myself. I point out to people on a regular basis, like, you know, nobody can get to where I've managed to get and I hope to get further without some help. And if you can't go ask people, hey man, can we uh, maybe do something together or whatever else, you might, you know, you, you might have to get used to no. Rejection does happen, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, you know, I, I, I thank my parents for giving us that as 
armor. It's like you go out there and you take, you know, and you dig for it and you dig for it, you dig for it. And if the dog closes, you kick it down, mm. you know, but we didn't, mm. we didn't, we weren't looking for any safe spaces because there were no safe spaces anywhere to be had except for inside your own home. And even then I remember playing with a flashlight, you know, as an eight year old, you know, with my brothers at night and my dad came down and was like, don't you ever turn on a flashlight in this house at night. The police will come into our house and shoot us all like dogs in our living room. Shit. I thought he was mad because he was wasting batteries. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I said that, my dad, yo. my dad loved wasting batteries. The double A's is like eight dollars, yo. No, but uh, I mean, I'm not spending eight dollars so you could play. But, <laughs> but my dad always said you could do whatever, you could do this and that in the house, but it's like don't you don't you do that? Now everybody still has that talk. And that talk is just as true as it is today because the fact of the matter is, and you can't tell people why, they cannot understand it, we do not live in the same world that everybody else you know, does. If that's just the truth. So you know, we better help each other. Um, and I'm happy to help. I'm glad I'm able to help a guy from Iraq who came speaking no English and is now one of our best guys. You know, that means a lot to me. And I don't care what your background is. You know, my main barrel guy comes from, you know, comes from Kentucky. And he didn't exactly come from money, you know, uh, uh, you know himself. There's no money in you know, it's no, <laughs> Well, there, there is, but it's not, not in beer. Dirt. I can tell it's you that much. <laughs> I think it might be a little bit around weed. Uh, but, uh, but, yeah. And, you know, and, and, and helping him, like, become something else. So whatever your background is, all great if we're all sharing but no one has come to me and said, hey, you know, can you, you know, give us a leg up? So I'm like, you know what, let me, let me get out there mm. with you guys and, and other people and, they say, like, and tell people, like, I am here and I've always been here. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Holla at your boy, but, Playboy so, Cardi. Now, I know, you know, we talked about safe space and all that, but I, I think a lot of it is, do you think people are just intimidated? Because we held a symposium yesterday, well, a couple of symposiums, and we were get, they were giving out keys. Like, so people were asking for the information on how we can get this going, how we can move forward, how do we find financing, how do we, you know, include, uh, Bovier, diversity and inclusion and whatnot. Now you, I mean, you got a lot of swag about you, so you, you intimidating to begin with, just with the, with the hat and all that, but like, <laughs> It's hard to come up with a dude with that much swag, be like, yo, help me. Yeah. <laughs> yo, it's like, you, you get to my age, you realize the only thing you can do is get better dressed. You know? <laughs> you, yeah, you can't you, run. Ain't yeah, you, you, yeah, yeah, you're like, you ain't gonna get no better looking. You know, physical. it's like, this, you know, like every, every, everything else you might have hoped for, that, that, that might have happened. You can get better dressed, though. You can always do that. Also, you know, so, so, so my girl likes me to put my clothes on as opposed to taking them off. <laughs> That's what's up. No, I could, I could be, I, hey, look, I can be intimidated by two guys, you know, half my age, or I can, you know, I can roll up in some swag. But the thing is, well, the funny thing is, I used to dress, a lot of times I would dress sometimes even in a, a, a suit, or I'd wear a tie, or whatever else, and people would say, oh, why don't you dress like uh, so-and-so? Why don't you dress like everybody else? Why don't you dress like Sam Calagione from Dogfish Head? Now, Sam's a good-looking guy. He used to be a model. And I told him, it's like, Sam's wearing a white T-shirt. If I ro rolled up in here wearing a white T-shirt, people would assume that I was homeless. Yeah. Yeah, we can't, like, you know, say that people, pe people, would ask, people would ask me stupid-ass questions, and it's like, by wearing a certain kind of clothes, you know, you wouldn't dare ask me the questions you were thinking of asking me, you know, when I come in front of you, you know, dressed like this. So I'm going to, you know, rather than get angry... I'm going to shut your questions down before you even get started, mm. you know, and now you look at me and you see who you're looking at and you, that question you were thinking about asking, you ain't going to go there, mm. you know, yeah. let's talk about the work and the thing that I came here to talk to you about, not like, oh, did you uh, make this up in your mom's bathtub or some crap like that? <laughs> oh, people used to, you well, first, of course, people used to walk right past me. They came to meet Garrett Oliver and would walk right past me, look through me. To your assistant. To my assistant, <laughs> yeah, yeah. who was from Stone Mountain, Georgia. You know, Kurt, Kurt was a perfectly nice guy, uh, uh, but you know, he was a standard dude that you'd see at, you know, at a beer festival, and it was a, you know, he was a tall white guy, whatever else. And they walk up to us like, like, hey Garrett, nice to meet you. And that was before anybody you know, knew what I looked like. Um, and the thing is that I am shielded from that now by the fact that within this realm, that doesn't happen anymore. 
But that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen to a bunch of other brothers in the room right. who, whose names right. are not known right now. I'm sure it happens to some of them every single damn day. My name is Edward Bailey. It happens <laughs> to be all the time. Garrett Thurston Oliver. I am, uh, you don't need to know my government name, Bracey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's your real name? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we want to uh, open up the uh, questions to the. Oh, we got. Oh, okay. So uh, do you know? Um, do you know Dapper Dan? Is that the? Do you know, I know? I do not know Dapper no Dan. Dapper, I would love yeah, to know Dapper Dan. Is that a stupid Dan. ass yeah. question? He's a. Uh, is a yeah. stupid ass. one of the stupid ass. He's like, listen, man. <laughs> no, we don't, funny know, thing, we no. don't all know each other, motherfucker. Like, <laughs> New York is no. New York is big as fuck. Like. No, the, 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 the one that people used to ask me all the time is. Do you know Neil deGrasse Tyson? You know, <laughs> because they're like, you're like, you know, like you both got that, you know, that 60s, 70s haircut. You both have a, a, a very similar voice. You both talk about science things or whatever else. You, you Negroes must know each other, you know, and, and it's like, and, and for a long time, of course, I didn't. And then I was, you know, I do some speaking engagements for National Geographic and, you know, and, and Neil work. deGrasse Tyson was there. And I said, like, you won't believe this. First of all. You know, our families, whatever else, have a bunch of connections. But people are always asking me whether, whether, whether I know you, and we've got to do this selfie. You know, and he, was, he looked confused. <laughs> you know, because he never heard of Garrett Oliver, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we did a picture, and it was, it was funny. So tell us about this beer here. Oh, this is... Because uh, uh, it, is, you know, this it is, is very delicious. Thank you. Uh, um, I don't know uh, if y'all those are, okay. had that or not. Yeah, we, we, we passed oh, yeah, them we, out. I don't know yeah, if y'all yeah, had them out, so hopefully, if you haven't you know, had any, ho- hopefully nobody's bogarting on you. You know, you uh, if you have drunk half the bottle yourself, it is about now. It's about now that you will discover that it is nine percent. Wait a minute. What we got is nine percent. Good luck getting down the stairs. This is nine percent. You know, from the top row of the bleachers where you thought nobody could see you drinking that bottle yourself. You know, because it might not go so well for you. Good then them shits is padded. You know, you might bounce once before you hit the floor. Nine uh, percent uh, Belgian Strong Golden. Uh, it was the first beer that we ever did, which was uh, this is nine percent. This this nine percent does it, it but doesn't smooth. drink like a nine. People say that all the time on yeah. this cast. Like it doesn't drink like a nine, but this really I would have never. No, never the, uh, uh, the 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 process of re fermentation in the bottle. Um, yeah, you know, refermentation of the bottle, so that beer goes into the bottle completely flat and gains all of its carbonation completely through the secondary fermentation. Now, here is a good example, though, of hell. Not maybe within our community, but, you know, at the brewery. Nobody in the United States knew how to do this. There were people who said that they did, but I looked into what they were doing, and they didn't. A lot of the Belgian breweries that said they were doing it weren't doing it. Found a guy working at a brewery in Belgium, Sam Bernardis. He was in between jobs. I said, could you come to New York City and teach us? Changed everything that we were going to do. And when he came in, I said, okay, you know, I'm brewmaster. I'm in charge of this place. But for the next three days, Bert is brewmaster. You know, I stand down. And now Bert teaches us everything, you know, that we know. And we are going to be angry. We're going to be pissed off. We're going to feel stupid because we're really good at what we do. And we've been doing the same thing for years. And we're good at it. And now we will become incompetent. And this is going to cause unhappiness because we don't want to be incompetent. You know, I want to be in charge and a leader, and I will not be leader for the next few days. But on the other side of this, we will be much better brewers than we were were before. And we will become competent again, and we will be at a different level. And once I had learned how to do this, and there was nowhere in any language that you could read how to do re-fermentation in a modern brewery. It actually didn't exist. It was passed down in families. So as soon as we learned to do it and do it well, the first thing that I did was in 2008 at the conference, I started giving talks on how to do this. If any of you wants to know how to do this, send me an email. My email is goliver at brooklynbrewery.com. Oh, I will tell you. With it. He just and made I, his own wow. show. Like, yeah, He's just no. 28133 older. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... I, I I'm telling you, I I will tell you absolutely everything, you know, and if you have a problem with it, you know, we will help you out with the problem, you know, because our, 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 our outlook is like, you know, look, I I got, I'm, I'm doing fine. It's like, you know, you want to bring it, 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, you know, like, I, I, you know, I, will, I will give you, you know, when you watch one of these kung fu movies, you know, you hand the other guy, here's a, here's a sword, and now I have one. Let's see what you got. You know, and, and, here, and you know, I, you know, it's like, like, I'm ready to get down when it comes to that, or we'll do a collaboration, or, or, or whatever. But, you know, I, I didn't make this up. You know, somebody right. taught me. Mm. So you, know, you, were, you were giving keys, so you give keys. Exactly that. Mm. And it's know. important, even at his level, though, being able yeah. to humble himself and be like, yo, I can learn something from I don't from know him. if he yeah. humbled himself. He said, he said www.getyourbeerright.com. You know what I mean? <laughs> I got I got these over here. I know yeah. this shit. I never <laughs> say things like that in public. You know, if I if I if, 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 if you got anything wrong with your beer, I might take you aside and said. <laughs> yeah. I wonder yeah, how many people are going to get a little sad over here today. Like like hey 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 yeah. come here young uh, man. Uh, <laughs> no, I you know, I have not. Uh, everything I've tasted so far has been. It's been really nice. Nice. So, so is that why it's, it's bubbling like that from the? Yeah, it has a higher level of carbonation. You know, uh, it, it's about more than half again as as uh, carbonated as as your standard beer. Um, so you know that's at about four volumes uh, of CO two, where you know your average is two point six, two point seven, and it's it's you you can only really get that from that secondary fermentation in the bottle. Well, I have a beer culture question. All right. At, at what level of ABV, if you're being, if you're able to brew and, and make some that smooth hop, at what level of ABV do you have to tell me before I drink? <laughs> Good question. I, 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 surprising me with a nine. I, I, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd say you know above seven, you should tell somebody something. Mm. Because I know. had some, and then you said it. Yeah, was yeah. <laughs> I'm like three. If, if, if you had been, if you, if you had been drinking this, gl- if you had been drinking this glass, you know, I would have oh, told okay, you okay. earlier. Okay. Uh, 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 but I figured everybody's had these little right. glasses, so there's only so much trouble you can get yourself in, unless you had five of them, in which case you're an asshole. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, like I said, I'm I'm about three into this. <laughs> so, because you because you you've been hogging it for yourself, and now you're gonna fall down the stairs. <laughs> you know, it's like that's your own damn fault. That's not my fault. <laughs> Got to take so, responsibility. So how do you... Says right here, I am responsible for Friday evening. Yeah, I, am I, not, read that. I am not responsible for Saturday morning. Says right here. <laughs> read, read the fine print. So how do you as a brewer like hide the ABV? I mean, like how do you brew a beer that is high ABV but doesn't, isn't all boozy? I mean, like, because I remember, I remember like, I would say like when I first got into it five, six years ago, sort of drinking like a nine, when you taste it, you felt all of that nine. And it feels like brewers are starting to get better at hiding that. Like I've had 10 and 11% beers that drink like, you know, six and sevens. That's and you're like, well, how, so like how do brewers hide that? It's partly uh, uh, the way you do your fermentation. You know, the way you're doing your fermentation is going to give off those higher alcohols that signify, you know, heat uh, uh, and give you that kind of flashiness that you would otherwise get. The uh, bottle conditioning does that. Age will help. Barrel conditioning can help with that. But a lot of it is technique. And we're getting, as brewers in the United States, better and better and better you know, at doing these things so that in this particular beer, that residual sweetness that you might feel like you taste is actually alcohol. Alcohol tastes sweet. Uh, The beer does not actually have high residual sugar. In fact, this is notably drier than Brooklyn Lager, but it tastes sweeter because the alcohol tastes sweet and that becomes part of the flavor profile. So for Brooklyn beers, what I always want to see is structure, balance, and elegance. Um, you know, I'm trying to create something which is really nice to drink. You know, I'm not a little kid. I'm not interested in having the bitterest, strongest, you know, hoppiest, whatever else. That, that's for children. That's like, you know, talking about uh, chef, oh, I put more salt in this stew than you've ever had before. <laughs> you, know, you know, I'll bet you're not man enough to dr- eat this much salt. You know, you know, you're not worthy. You can't even handle this much salt, can you? you, know, you know, like, anyway, we'd be like, you're crazy. You know, yeah. like you're, you're, you've obviously yeah. lost your mind. Yeah. You know, it's like I'm, I'm, we're just trying to make something that we hope is delicious. You know, and one thing that's important is, and I think as all of us go out there, especially in this community, um, you know, we owe it to everybody who spends money on our beer to do everything we can to bring quality. Because if you're not working on quality, if you're not, you know, stringent about it, what that is is disrespect. It's disrespect for your customer. You know, this bottle of beer costs ten dollars. You know, or so somebody might have gone and worked an hour. You know, somewhere at a job they don't even like to make enough money mm. to buy this beer. 
And then through ego, you're going to have an attitude like, oh, it's fine when you know that it's not what it should be. That's disrespect. Mm. You know, and, and that is something that we, you know. Get your ethics up. No, I feel, I feel strongly, up. you know, we, got, we have to feel lucky that people are willing to give us money for something that we enjoy doing. Mm. You know, and if you don't think that you're, you don't think that you're lucky, you know, to be able to do this, then you have the wrong head on. You know, and if you're coming to this from ego and you think that you're special, it's like, you know what? If your brewery burned down in the morning, my brewery disappeared, I disappeared, the river keeps on flowing, man. Like, it has got nothing mm. to do with you. Yeah. You know, it's like mm. you, you threw your little rock and you made a splash. And then, you know, when, when, when you were gone and the river is still there, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know, and your rock is gone and everything else, nobody's going to remember your shit, you know. So, you know, get it right today for this person who spent money that they worked a job at to, to make that money, you know, that's who you're working for, you know. Uh, uh, and that's, that's super important. You know, if my, if my name is on the box, you know, or my signature's on there, that represents a promise, and I better keep it. Nice. That, that is... Nice. That's actually a great transition. Yeah. This man's of the people, for the people. And so now, you know, we've had an opportunity to have a conversation with Mr. Oliver, but we will open it up to the audience for questions now. Yeah, and, and let's just be very clear. We got about 30 seconds, man. Last time we did <laughs> yeah, this... Don't, Hey, no we dissertations. Did this, was doing dissertations and shit. Like, I mean, hey, let me read you. Know my, what uh, you want to say before you get to the mic. Yeah, man, you got thirty seconds to ask your questions, and then we're gonna give a couple of minutes for Mr. Oliver to. You get two ums. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> two ums, fam. No. <laughs> What's good? No, I'm Swallow. Out. Mike Swallow. Went on first. I'm Pause. not going anywhere. We'll Pause. be we'll, we'll, we'll be we'll be outside hanging out, Check. drinking some beer. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Clear your throat. Yo. What's good? Brandon Montgomery, San Diego. Question, how do you decide on which uh, research and development beers to put on, out in the market? Uh, that's, that's a really good question. We do, uh, we do all kinds of research and development beers. You know, some of them are what we call the ghost bottles, which are all the things that we make that we don't actually sell. And some of them are, are, you know, are too small or whatever else or too difficult to do on a commercial basis. But, I mean, recently we started doing some stuff with uh, Pierre Chim, you know, the uh, Senegalese chef, for example. And in that case, we're like, I was looking at that as an African grain, et cetera. He's looking to pay, you know, really good prices back to indigenous farmers throughout Central Africa. This is a grain that thousands of years ago was widely used for brewing. It happens to make some great flavors. And I'm looking at, well, can we reach different communities? Can we do something for farmers? Can we put our money where our mouth is and make a beer, you know, that, uh, uh, that is delicious? And show out by saying, "Oh, yeah, I know you never heard of this before, but now, now, like here, you know, here it is." Because I mean, I I remain competitive, and like I want to get there before you. Like I, I still want to get there before you. It's like I, you know, it's like I'll hand it over later, but I want to get, I want to be there first. You know, so yeah. uh, you get to do everything at once. And I, I look at something. It's like, okay, what has nobody seen before? Um, rather than let's do the same juicy IPA over and over again. Love them when they're good, but it's like I don't want to repeat other people's work. Nice. How, do we, how do we get our hands on one of them ghost bottles? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, where are them ghost bottles at? Let's talk about it. We'll talk about it. I'll talk about it. We'll book a flight. We'll talk about it. Hello. Thank you all for this conversation. It's been um, really informative. Uh, my name's Tini Dever. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and my work is, most of my work is based in Durham, North Carolina. Um, we have a few, few breweries in North Carolina. Um, and I'm currently researching a project um, trying to explore how a craft that, um, as you've mentioned, started in uh, Africa in the Fertile Crescent, uh, became so synonymous with white blue collar, co white blue collar culture in the U.S. Um, so I'd be just interested in any initial thoughts that you have about that, since you seem to have such a deep, um, particularly Mr. Oliver, since you have a, such a deep kind of a history around beer and beer culture, um, whether that has to do with just kind of, um, I don't know, the way that beer was advertised, or just I'd just be interested in your initial thoughts about that. Well, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of advertising around big beer, part of the matrix was selling beer as, you know, exclusive. They wanted to fish where the fish are, where they thought the fish were in a certain way and, and, and look past us and, you know, and, and denigrate women. You know, so you'd see all these misogynist ads 
that told women that beer wasn't for them when traditionally it was the women who were doing the actual brewing. Mm. Um, Including my grandmother, which every single year. So, um, and so, you know, I think that there's a lot of blame to go around. And if you want to shine that back in our direction, it's like, look, we don't, we don't advertise. And where did we go when we go to look for something? I mean, yeah, we were the first supporters of the Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival and whatever else. We try to, you know, be out there in the community. But basically, we showed up with whoever invited us. And when we got there, you know, you had the crowd that you had, but we weren't going looking for inclusion or looking to, you know, to rope in bunches of people on purpose. We're like, we've, we're, we've come to the party and this is where the party is. Um, I think that, have, that changing your, your outlook on that uh, is important. But also, a lot of what I'm trying to do is understand, you know, and respect the customer. And it's something that I'm not... I'm not proud of, but there were years ago where I would look out in the crowd and I see 82 year old lady and she's got a blue rinse and I'm wondering like, what the hell is she doing here? <laughs> like I'm going to be pouring lamb beaks and smoke beers and whatever else. I don't think that, you know, I don't know how she ended up here, but I don't, I don't know if she can handle it. And who's that old dude and whatever else. I thought I knew that our customer looked a certain way because I got brainwashed by the same culture that we we're putting out. And then at the end of the tasting, she comes up and says, wow, this is the best imperial stout I ever had. And she wants to know, like, you know, where exactly, what kind of Brett was going on. This, and you're like, what? <laughs> you know, and then, and then you realize, like, I'm sitting here, you know, she's older than me, and I have judged her in advance, you know, for being a woman, for being older, for being this, for being that, which is exactly the same goddamn thing that they did to me, and I was doing it to her unconsciously. So mm. what I do now is like, I, everybody's flat. I don't care who you are, where you come from. I'm going to present it to you. I'm going to tell you why it's interesting and what it is and what it tastes like and what you might do with it. And then you decide what you're going to do with it. But I don't talk down to anybody anytime anymore. You know, and I think that's super important in everything that we do. You know, and that by itself does something, I hope. Yes, thank you. Yeah, got to remove that unconscious bias. Nice. Two arms, fam. Two this arms. Be, this is going to be short. Short. Nigel from Kansas City. I um, asked this question yesterday at the symposiums. In Kansas City, I go to breweries all the time. I'm generally the only person of color. What, would you, what, what a would surprise. You, <laughs> right. That's what they said yesterday. What would be your strategies to reach out to some people of color and say, hey, let's get into some of these breweries? Because I think part of it is they just don't know. But I'm looking for maybe your advice and, uh, and going back and saying, hey, maybe we could do this, that, or the other to get some of our people to experience this that they, they don't know anything about it. What do you say about that? Well, I think that you guys are actually doing it. You know, I am learning here today things from you about how to, you know, how to do that myself because being here for 30 years, I am personally insulated, you know, from a lot of the things that you might deal with. You know, people just won't do that with me anymore. So I got the shields up. Um, and you got to realize that not everybody had these advantages. They may be intimidated by a situation. They might be intimidated by me. They might look at the room and look in there and say, well, those don't look like my people. And so going to where people actually are, um, supporting the things that they're interested in. Um, I mean, I've started doing some work through the Brownsville Community Center, you know, in New York, which is seeing, you know, uh, uh, local, mostly African-American kids how to, you know, how to do the fine dining, you know, thing, whether it's in the kitchen, et cetera, exactly what Kwame, you know, is doing at a much higher level, you know, in, uh, in the stuff that he's doing. So I think it's just a matter of, of being present, not only, you know, in the places where the stream naturally takes you, but it's like, okay, the stream's going this way. I'm going to go this way to actually do something you know, that has a purpose to it beyond, hey, let's sell some beer and throw the same party over and over and over again with the same people. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. I changed the culture. We sick of these parking lot. We sick of these parking lot festivals, man. I mean, throw those was ass. Well, you know, I, you know I, I don't understand tailgating. It's like, you know, we worked really hard to get into the stadium and now people are having a, a you know, thing in the parking lot. I don't know about that. <laughs> you know, you like, got to have tickets like, to get I, in. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. <laughs> you just got to have know. a truck to tailgate. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. There's like plenty, plenty of black folks, you know, tailgating. It's like, I'm from New York. You know, so I'm like, the, I, got, I got new cultural things to learn. There you go. <laughs> uh, my name is Winston, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Brooklyn in the building. Brooklyn's in the building. Yeah, yeah. Look at that hat. <laughs> yeah, 
the reality is that uh, one of your beers was my gateway into craft beer, the Brooklyn Monster, um, back in back in 2011. Well, thank you, sir. You know, and my first part of my question is, would you ever bring that back? Because anybody who has never had that is one of the most fantastic beers um, that has ever been made. And two, what is what is the beer style that you have found the most difficulty uh, making? Ah, uh, you know, two good questions. Well, one, maybe Moss will come back in some in some form. We've done other barley wines. We want to expand, you know, the kinds of barley wines that we make. Right now, we have one called Capataz, which is uh, aged for a year in sherry barrels. So that's like, you know, kind of the current one. So all of them have some monster in them. Uh, that one's available only on draft, but... Uh, just, uh, you know, put some on up at Harlem Hops, you know, uh, up in Harlem, New York. So I was visiting those guys a few weeks back. Great place, great people, you know, bringing craft beer into that community. Um, but the second, I mean, straight up Pilsner is really, you know, you got to be on it every day, you know, to brew, you know, to brew Pilsner. You know, because there's nowhere to hide. There's no extra flavors, et cetera. You know, you either got it or you don't. You know, so if, if I want to if I want to go see whether somebody is really good, I'm, I'll drink their pills there first. It's like, you know, the French chef says, go ahead and make me an omelet. And you think, well, an omelet simple. It's like not in front of a French chef. It's not uh, uh, yeah. simplest thing in the world, but really, really, really difficult to do it at the level that a French chef wants to see. Pilsner's the same way. If you can impress a German with your Pilsner, then you know you kind of have it, you know. Nice. All right. So, before we wrap up, I have a question, and it's stupid as shit, but I don't know. I, texture is a thing. Food is a thing. I mean, I, I'd imagine you're, you know, a connoisseur of food, and you love all that. Um, what is your favorite form of potato? Oh. Why do you keep doing this? Wow, that is Why that is really difficult. This? What is what is what is your favorite form of potato? That is very difficult. I you know I have so many stories to tell about potatoes. <laughs> I mean, everybody about, does. You know, potatoes, no, but are I mean, very, I'm talking about like have you know, no uh, potato uh, stories. You know, met, you know, met, trying to do and messing up. I do great mashed potatoes, but I was trying to do that kind of classic French potato puree that's like half butter, and I kept messing it up you know, for a while and finally got it down last year for Christmas after asking three chefs how they do it in a professional kitchen because I'd always ended up with a gummy mess. Um, so I can do that now. But the thing that I do most often, cue the potatoes up, parboil them for like four minutes, let them dry out for a couple of minutes, and then toss them in a wok in duck fat. Why you keep swagging on us? <laughs> Why you gotta keep swagging on us? Yo, 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 man, you don't even know. Them shits get all crunchy, like on the outside. They, they were like really pillowy on the inside. You never had any of them? No, I ain't done nothing. No, you need to come over, man. Like, what you been doing? Nothing with a duck. (laughs) Yo, swag on us. Everybody eats potatoes. And there's so many different forms. No, it's a texture thing. It's yeah, all a texture. Yeah, but we, you know, like, you know, they took the ducks from us too. We didn't have any ducks when I was growing up. Ducks. Yeah, there was no ducks. There was no lamb. You know, I thought ducks were like. Poisonous, like yeah, and that's what they told you, man. They told you the ducks were poisonous. You see ducks in a pond in East Cleveland. You're not touching them. Yeah, well, well, pigs. Like we eat pigs. We eat all kind of wild shit. What are you talking about? Yeah, but you. All right, you said ducks are poisonous. I'm telling you, you ain't eating duck. Yo, duck fat is a beautiful duck fat. I will tell you is liquid at room temperature. Not so like how, that stuff that my mom had in the Crisco can, you know, that was solid, like, no matter what you did to it, mm, unless you it put a, a good big fat. flame under it. It was a good it was, fat. It was good fat, but, like, you know, duck fat is good for you uh, uh, as well as actually tasting amazing, so. Mm. See, y'all I'll thought take it was stupid. for it. I ain't fucking with that. No, go, yo, go ask now Mommy. He'll tell you about that duck fat. Yeah, you know I mean? Now y'all about to go out and get them duck <laughs> fat fries. You know yeah, duck know fat I'm... fries, man. I'm telling you right now. Mm. Not your boy. All right, look. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> but you could be. <laughs> I'm gonna send you some. I'm gonna send you a jar. They'll, you, that jar will be here, Fresh Fest 2020. It will be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll be full. It probably won't have decomposed. It'll have a loaf of bread next to it, Schwabel. <laughs> yeah. So look. We got to wrap this up because we got like a whole ass festival. That we got three thousand people coming to this yeah. motherfucker here. <laughs> Woo! So it's we just the just, beginning. 
We just want to allow, you know, a lot of a lot of people were looking forward to this. I know I was. We want to just allow the crowd just to give you a round of applause and appreciate, you know, what you came, the, the information <laughs> bestowed upon us, taking your time out to come chill with us. Well, you know. So enlightening. So I'm, crazy. This is what the festival is, though. I want to appreciate not only you guys, but, you know, uh, uh, you know, all the people also in the room who are not out of the African-American community, but are here with us in this room, you know, doing this here. thing, See you know, folks. enjoying the same things, and in a way embodying the idea that we always had, that we were all supposed to be in the same damn room in the first place, having yeah. a good time, Facts. which is the yeah. point. Facts. You know. Facts. And... You know, try, trying to make it happen. So no matter what your background is, if you're here, you're one of us. You there know, you and that is the most important thing, that we all have a good time together. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what it's about. You know, you can't have, you know, togetherness around beer. You are in some hot shit trouble. Yeah. There are, <laughs> there are 45 collaboration beers out there. And this is also a collaboration here as well. Yes. So, I mean, give it up for yourself for being inclusive and getting the fucking the, the, the picture, man. Yeah, so we got to do the business of the cast because not everybody was here. They let the people know who were listening, where they can find us because we need downloads on this. Hey, Tell man, if you're, uh, if you're looking for us, you can find us on epicastnetwork.com slash partnerspot. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Lipson, Google Play, and Spotify under Drinking Partners. You can find us on IG, Twitter, and Facebook at Partners Pod. Once again, we got to thank our guest, Garrett Oliver, for coming through. We got to thank Work Hard and Epicast for the live stream. They make this all possible. They make us seem professional because we really just up here drinking and talking shit. Uh, as always, Drinking Partners is the crew. Epicast is the family. Fresh Fest is the business. And we about to go out. Good night and thank you. <laughs>